tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hello, folks. It's summertime and the listening is easy. Of course, what to choose? What to choose? Well, on the Simply Scary Network, there's all kinds of spooky entertainment ready to give you the chills you need to get through all this heat. Don't miss the latest episode of Drew Blood's Dark Tales with new episodes premiering Fridays. And of course, don't forget Horror Hill with Eric Peabody, Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, Fear from the Heartland with Paul J. McSorley. And you can find them all at simplyscarypodcast.com on YouTube or your favorite podcasting service. Or be sure to visit the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.com website and become a patron. And hear extended episodes from our vast audio archive. Now, pull up your chair or whatever it is you're currently sitting in and listen for a moment. Imagine, if you will, that you've been imprisoned on a 60 year prison sentence. Now, also imagine you've been given that sentence due to a crime you didn't even commit. Only one person's shaky testimony is what stands between you and freedom. That's the story in the most recent suspect, Five Shots in the Dark. Campside Media and Wondery have joined forces to present to you the thrilling mystery of the murder of Casey Sean, found shot to death in his pickup truck. Leon Detroit Benson was suspected of the murder, but only one eyewitness was enough to put him behind bars. But exactly how reliable is the testimony that put him there? And what if there was evidence to prove his innocence? Enjoy Suspect, Five Shots in the Dark on the Wondery app, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to Suspect early and ad-free on Wondery Plus. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. I get my true crime fix from Wondery. Why not do the same? Grab a cool drink, sit a spell, and join us for a scary good time. We're waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 13, Episode 11. I'm your host, Otis Jari, and in this episode, I'll be performing two tales to terrify you, courtesy of author James Thurwell and N.M. Brown. Tonight we'll hear stories of questionable murders, drug-related disasters. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first spine-tingling story. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, 
it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show's about to begin. <laughs> Some reporters like to get the full story, and sometimes that story goes a lot deeper than anyone really wants to know. For instance, take a message a young man received from his brother, who supposedly died months ago committing a terrible crime. Would you believe such a simple act would result in the uncovering of a much more disturbing truth? Without further ado, I present to you... Hey, I cry for help. I find the story I'm about to relate to you somewhat difficult to tell, because in writing um, about it, I had to break rules of how I operate. You see, normally I try to keep a level of professional distance from the story, usually only going about as far as interviewing those that are involved and living it at that. I'm a journalist, after all. Despite the kinds of news I try to uncover, I don't feel as if my hand being involved would keep the story as neutral as I'd like. Yes, I do admit I would hope stories would be true. Why wouldn't I prefer to be correct, given all the circumstances? But hoping it's true is very different than being involved in the outcome of the story, which in this case, I must report I was unable to avoid. However, it's ironic that if it were not for my involvement at all, there might not even be a story to tell. The details would be hidden away from sight, and you'd be left entirely in the dark, and I would be left without my publishing revenues. But let me begin from the beginning, and I'm sure this will clear itself up shortly. I was forwarded a message from a source that I'll refer to as Alan who received this message from his brother, to whom I will refer to as Peter. Alan had heard about my work and asked me to investigate, because the source of the message was interesting enough. You see, Peter had reportedly died three months ago, but this message was received within the previous few days. The message read, It's me, Peter. I'm not dead. There isn't much time, but find me. Clay's here, too. He's not dead. What are they doing to him is... off. The message ends there, but as it was sent, my assumption, made at the time, was that Peter, or whoever was acting as him, sent the message before being caught, or pretended to be caught. Based on what information I had, it was difficult to piece together the background of Peter, as he was a bit of a social media recluse. He had no Facebook, no Twitter, Instagram, or anything of the sort. Nor do I really blame him for it. But I eventually landed a hit on a news story where his full name cropped up. School board member assassinated by local delivery driver. You would have thought such an event would have surpassed into greater news, even considering the local politics involved. But there it was. A single story referring to Peter as a driver for hire, for reasons entirely unclear, shot and killed a local school board member whom, as you may have wondered in the text above, I shall be referring to as Robert Klein. The event was caught on video by a group of teenagers who were hanging around in the school parking lot after hours, as I could attest by the video clip attached to the story. They appear to be just minding their own business and doing whatever goofy things teenagers do these days when they heard the shouting. At this point, the camera swung around and captured Peter standing in front of the school building, shouting incoherently at Klein, who seemed to be eyeing Peter with a mixture of concern and disinterest. That was until Peter pulled a gun and shot him a few times in the chest. At that point, the yells from the teenagers drowned out everything else, though Peter nonchalantly began to walk away. He hadn't gotten very far, though, when he seemed to stop, think about what he had just done, and, despite the protests from the teenagers, put a gun into his own mouth and pulled. 
I've seen graphic videos before of various events, and though the video was presented unedited, the distance from the actual scene of the crime made it only slightly more watchable than others I've seen. But it seemed fairly straightforward. Murder-suicide. Common these days, though thankfully with less bloodshed than others. Things didn't get my suspicions raised, though, until I tried to contact the local police to find out more about the video evidence, as well as how to contact the witnesses that were on the video. I received back a shock. None of the witnesses have been called to verify this information. When asked how the police and media received the video, they said they received a phone call from an individual who said he had a video of the murder of Robert Klein and would be sending it to them shortly. The individual offered no personal information, and the email arrived from a bulk transfer service with no name attached. My first thought was how this individual was able to send these items anonymously. Well, actually, that was my second thought. My first thought was how a local law enforcement branch would just accept an anonymous tip like this and call it a day. Finding things now very much intriguing, I found out how far away this locale was. Torn between the cost of gas and wear and tear on the car or a plane ticket, I opted for the plane, though it was a tough call. Getting a decent rental car, I first stopped to check in with Alan to get all I could from him about his brother. There wasn't much to gather, really, as there wasn't much of a story to tell. Alan had never known his brother to be political about anything, let alone care about the local school board, so Peter's actions were a complete surprise to him. He was more interested in the latest call of duty than he was in any kind of social movement, though he did admit that Peter struck him as someone who would never want to handle a firearm if he could at all help it. I didn't go into details on how even those who abhor guns suddenly would find an excuse to use one if necessary, as I didn't think Alan would need to hear a lecture on that, but I didn't come away with the impression that Peter would have done such a thing unless forced to by some outside agency. Neither Peter nor Clay knew each other, not even in passing, and it made no sense why Peter would go commit murder and then kill himself for no sensible reason. It made no social statement. It wasn't an act of passion. So why do it? I wanted to find out more from the local police, but one other item in Alan's story made me pause. I mentioned, almost in passing, that it must have been difficult to identify his brother at the police station. But he said that never happened. Sure, he was contacted by the police and he gave a statement, but was informed that video evidence had identified his brother and that the remains were in too horrific a state that there was no need to request a familial identification. That screamed red flag to me. I know for a fact that any identity verification was encouraged wherever possible, even when all that existed was a left eyeball and a severed toe. It might have been hard, but records are records. I didn't know a single police station that would have turned down that opportunity unless something wasn't on the up and up. This, again, I did not relay to Alan at the time, though he certainly is aware now if he is reading this. As between this part of the story and the information I had originally received, I now believe that the local law enforcement in town had a part to play in this that I did not care for. Now, I understand life is in the movie, and that perhaps I was reading too much into this. They may have just been a small department unused to this kind of tragic event and made assumptions about procedure that other departments would be horrified to view. But I still felt apprehensive, because I still couldn't help thinking if I asked the wrong kinds of questions that I wouldn't find myself placed in some cell for a little while before being carted off to some unknown testing facility where I'd spend the rest of my days watching my disembodied brain being used to control an army of irritable super-soldier monkeys. Well, if I'm going to be taken away and used as a test subject, I would hope my future would be in something strange and weird. I hate to be carted away to count beans.
I did finally strike up the courage to go to the police station, and I did confirm that indeed they were a fairly small police force, maybe about 20 people, including management and higher-ups, and their idea of filing paperwork was a little lax. It didn't seem to be part of the main force, though. Apparently, the superior there, Chief Morgan, was the one who seemed to hold low standards. Unlike many police chiefs, he was not a sworn officer, but an installed pencil pusher, though which department put him in was a little in question. He was put in his position by the city council, and they recalled voting him into the position, but they weren't quite sure who gave the recommendation. It was some obscure state department well over the city's heads, and they just accepted it without question. For me, this raised another red flag, but based on the evidence I'd seen so far, this was mainly my own connections and general distrust of authority, rather than anything concrete. Bureaucracy is full of all kinds of mix-ups, screw-ups, paperwork problems, and the like, but this may have been the first instance that I'd seen in a very long time, where the lack of a proper paper trail appeared to be intentional. This was a conclusion I reached because I met with Chief Morgan briefly during my visit. This was not because I wanted to. I'm sure an interview would have been given me a lot of information, but I really don't want to draw a lot of attention to myself either. But he heard my conversation with the main staff and he invited me in to answer any questions that I might have had. And here's where the issue sits. Morgan tried really hard to be a diplomat, telling me it was a very tragic event, and one the town would likely never recover from quickly. But that really everything that could be done already was. Both Clay and Peter had been cremated, he said, and the bodies interred in the local mausoleum, as per wishes of both families. I knew this was partly true, because Alan had told me so, but what wasn't mentioned was the cremation had taken place before the request was made clear, which again raised further suspicion. I did raise the question with Morgan as to why Peter had gotten into an argument and fired at Klein to begin with, since there seemed to be no bad blood between them. But Morgan's answer was fairly simple. There was a tip dispute, most likely, as Peter had been seen delivering food to the school building only a little while prior as part of his job. For those of you following along, this I did confirm. The school board had been having a meeting, proving Klein had been there, and receipts showed Peter had made the delivery there around the time in question. The tip was, well, I wouldn't say it was anything close to generous, but the amount didn't seem enough to murder anyone over. Well, we'd established motive and opportunity, though both were weak on the surface. The only other questions I had involved the video that had been received, as well as where I could speak to the reporter who bylined the original story I found. Morgan informed me the front desk would have a USB with a copy of the video file, so I could look at the full thing myself, though as far as the reporter, that wouldn't be as easy. The reporter hadn't reported for work in over a month, and by all accounts, skipped town to avoid an overdue rent payment. Naturally, a rent jumper didn't have a new address that would have been on record. I thanked Morgan for his time, but here again, this was the reason I distrusted him so much. Here was one of the biggest stories this town had had in some time, and yet there was almost no reporting on a big event such as open public murder, the assassination of a school board member, no less. Even more... While the main force seemed to be a little more disgruntled about it, the chief himself not only showed as much interest in it as an actual film school board meeting, but ignored almost every standard in the book about handling the situation, especially for someone handpicked for the job at the state level. His disinterest didn't seem to be that of a man stuck in a relatively small Midwestern town with no hopes or aspirations of anything better. No, this was the attitude of someone, purposefully, trying to stifle a story, keep the real events under wraps, but it escaped me why he would be doing such a thing. With a copy of the video on USB, I left the station and went to my rental car, 
where I hooked it up and ran the video through the first thing I could think of. A program a colleague of mine created that could detect errors and discrepancies in the file. The process took far longer than I expected it to, but the findings shocked me. and Let me know I had stumbled across something that went beyond a simple shooting. The video was a fake, and by fake, I mean a very cleverly constructed, edited, and developed fake designed to fool anyone who actually watched it. The level of skill meant this was intentional. The faces on the video themselves were deep fakes, though incredibly detailed and well-built ones. My friend's programs only detected them on a third sweep of the algorithms of the video, at which point it noticed that Klein's and Peter's faces were superimposed onto others, as well as the faces of the witnesses. Nobody in that video was who they were supposed to be, but unlike some videos where a reverse search can find an original clip, nothing came up to match this video. This meant that the scene was staged completely and utterly with fake actors who then had faces superimposed on top. A murder created entirely from nothing. Actors. Phonies. Suddenly, so much began to line up. There was no need for Alan to confirm the remains because there were no remains. There was no need for massive paperwork because there was nothing to report. There was no crime scene. This meant the message from Alan could very well have been real, and I had no reason to believe it wasn't. For one, fake messages were unnecessarily cruel to a family that probably had dealt with enough. Second, they talked about Klein being alive as well, which seemed unnecessary given the situation. Third, a fake message only drew attention closer to the real story, which by all accounts was the last thing anyone involved would want. This whole thing was buried, completely untouched, until Alan received the message, and whatever was trying to be covered up was now open to scrutiny. I knew there was something to uncover, and I was going to find out what it was, no matter what. I was too close to something truly remarkable to pack up and go home now, but I knew I had to be careful. At least one person in the police department knew the story was a fake, and the fact that I was even here investigating it meant they probably knew something was up and I'd have to be extra cautious. Of course, at this point, I also realized I had no further leads. I knew now that Peter and Klein, if I was lucky enough, were being held somewhere, but I had no idea where to even begin to try to locate them, and I certainly wasn't going to ask anyone in town. Either they would have no idea, or they were actively interested in me not finding out. I then realized that I had one very small chance, and a lot of it hinged on pure chance. I went back to the original message I'd received from Alan, to see if the note from Peter had an email address that wasn't some sort of obvious fake. Well, from the look of it, it was an unusual email, nothing I could recognize just from looking at it. But considering this was a real message calling for help, then it was possible there was no attempt to hide the location or use any kind of encryption technology, and that this might just be able to be tracked to a genuine IP address. This is why it pays to have friends in cyber technology. I have a few other programs on hand that could do this sort of thing, and I was incredibly happy to receive a ping back. Sure, they probably got a hit on their security systems, but it would at least give me a clue. I typed the IP into a geolocator, and again, I got a hit. It was not an exact location, but it did give me a hit on an area roughly three miles away from where the supposed fake murder took place. One, a blank area of map. I drove over there to take a look. While I wasn't sure what to expect exactly, I did expect a building. What I didn't expect was a large, flat, empty field. It didn't make any sense why an empty lot would have an IP address in the middle of it, and I took an hour or so to walk up and down a few times wondering what I was missing. It was only when I walked along a certain stretch did I notice a rumbling under my feet and a sort of mechanical screech. 
the subway? In a town this size? Didn't seem right. But I double-checked on my map and was half right. It wasn't a subway in the sense that it was entirely underground, but rather a section of train that ran underneath a hillside. It seemed simple enough. A killing, point-blank gunshot, a witness, and a sentence of 60 years in prison. Justice served, right? Except, what if that witness testimony didn't hold up to scrutiny? And the evidence suggests the supposed killer didn't do the deed after all. Find out more about the case of Casey Sean on Suspect, Five Shots in the Dark in which Leon Detroit Benson was accused of murder, but an unreliable witness and a community with a rightful fear of the local law enforcement shows that the case is not so simple after all. Suspect is brought to you by Wondery and Campside Media. And when I want to tune into the best in true crime, I turn to Wondery. Enjoy Suspect, Five Shots in the Dark, on the Wondery app, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to Suspect early and ad-free on Wondery Plus. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. The train station itself was above ground, and the tracks led out about two miles down the way. Knowing this, there was definitely a good chance that my mysterious IP address would be accessible from there. I drove over to the train station and, trying my best to avoid being seen by any personnel, walked along the track and toward the awaiting tunnel. No one stopped me, but then again, I also didn't see any cameras either, which was very odd, because an area like this, anywhere else in the country, would be loaded with them. Maybe they were just stealthier than I thought. Or perhaps whoever was here figured themselves untouchable. A very haughty attitude, but I couldn't throw off that idea. I didn't bring a flashlight, but I did have the light of my phone, which at least kept me from stumbling. The tunnel itself was very narrow, to the point that I really hoped no trains came by because I didn't think I was thin enough to squeeze along the side of the wall to avoid being crushed, and I wasn't brave enough try throwing myself onto the ground between the rails and pray it would pass over. Though the lights were small and didn't do much to dispel the many shadows, it was surprising to see they were LEDs. Someone clearly wanted to keep this tunnel as modern as possible, which only made it more convincing that I was on the right track. I didn't encounter any trains, thankfully. But I had been walking about ten minutes when I saw a smaller maintenance tunnel off to one side. I stepped into it and cautiously moved forward. No tracks here, but a standard-sized hallway for people to use, and it eventually came to a door. No lock, no visible security, but it opened into what appeared to be a standard maintenance room. Tools, small parts, things that wouldn't require a lot of hard work and effort to install were stored here, but no computer. I got crestfallen, thinking maybe I was unlucky and that the IP address belonged to a laptop, and the owner was actually somewhere else now, and I was running on a wild goose chase, when a section of the wall I was standing in front of opened like a door, pulling sideways. This was less surprising than the man who stood there, who seemed equally less surprised about the door opening, and more that someone was unexpectedly on the other side. He didn't say a word as he wrapped his fingers around my throat, squeezing harder than I thought anyone was capable of. I saw spots in my vision almost immediately, and my breath caught in my throat with a gurgle. He pressed me against the firewall, and he probably would have killed me right then and there, had I not blindly reached over and found something that felt like a large wrench, which I swung into his head. His grip dropped away as I watched a bloody mark appear in his skull, and he dropped to the ground. I didn't know if he was dead or not, but at that moment I didn't care. My breath tore at my throat, scratchy and painful. I searched him, and while I didn't have much on him, he did have an ID card, which I hoped would be enough to get into the rooms 
see what I could find. The secret door in the maintenance room remained open, but beyond was a brightly lit hallway using the same LEDs as the one in the tunnels. It was uncomfortably warm as well, humid. It almost felt tropical in there, though I had no idea why anyone would do that. Make it difficult to locate on scanning? Weird tastes of the workers here? Who's to say? All the hallways seemed the same, but so far I'd encountered no one else, which I was grateful for, since my breathing was still difficult, and I could probably be heard coming a mile away. I wondered how big this place could be, whether there were other floors and if they had similar mazes of halls leading off to who knows where. It was then I realized what a stupid idea this had been. I had let my mistrust of the police in the area lead me to believe that I couldn't trust anybody at all, and though I do set an item out for delivery to certain individuals when I go traveling, in the event I don't come back, it would do me no good right here and now. I had no one to cover me, to know where I was, and so I was on my own. It was as if I was musing on this very idea that I came to a door labeled Test Subject A, and by labeled, I do mean labeled, as in the door had a sheet taped on the window. It had a keycard scanner next to it, and finally, tired of skulking around the hallways, I swiped it. I got a green and stepped inside the room. I was in a small, dimly lit room, complete with a bed, a closet, a small computer in the corner. I then realized this must have been the computer I was looking for. Peter must have been given a personal computer to sit at, and somehow had gotten past their servers and reached the outside world. That's what I thought at first. Then I heard a voice come from its speakers. Can I help you? I don't think I've seen you before. I looked at the computer, the screen remained blank, but I definitely not imagined the sounds coming from it. Uh, hello? Yes, right here. What, are you blind or something? I went over and had a seat. Are you Peter? If so, your brother forwarded me your message. He did? It got out? I can't believe it. Please, you have to help me get out of here. I looked at the screen. Sure, sure. Just tell me which room you're in. It's a maze in here. You're in the room with me. What? Why? Why are you looking at me like that? I felt my stomach knot up as I began to realize that what I had hoped would be a rescue mission was not likely to end as one. It certainly explained how someone who is likely not very computer literate was able to send a message to the outside world. Peter, you're not in the room with me, or at least not directly. I'm speaking to a computer screen. That's ridiculous. I'm right here talking to... But that... How am I able... I got the sense that deep down, Peter had somehow been aware something was wrong, but couldn't quite put his finger on it. Why would anyone here tell him? It was a test subject, after all. I just wondered now where his physical body was. Peter, I, I know things are strange right now, but I... How can I be here? Where am I? Why can't you see me? I see you. I see this room. I see... I'm looking all around. If I was just a computer, I couldn't turn my head, right? I don't know, Peter. It could be a virtual representation of this place you're seeing. Is it possible you're strapped into some device somehow? Do you feel a helmet? I... I don't feel anything. I don't feel anything at all. I don't even feel cold or hot. I'm... I'm... Uh, am I even here anymore? I waited a little bit, waiting to see if Peter could get his senses together and find something. Anything to ground himself. He kept repeating similar phrases over and over. And I began getting concerned that he would snap and I could do nothing with him or for him. But then he took a moment and quieted, and I heard the hard drive on the computer spin up. It made me smirk. For all the newest technologies in this place, this one computer still had a classic-style hard drive that needed a seek. 
I waited a few moments. What's your name? Me? I'm James Thurwell. I'm a journalist. Most of the time. James? I, I found where my body is, or was. It turns out that if I focus, I can pull up folders like I can think myself into Windows folders. It's, it's gone. They disposed of it two months ago. All I am now is this voice. I don't know how I'm still alive. Am I still alive? Alive enough to talk to me. That, that enough for you? Can I leave here? Uh, I don't know. But Peter, why are you here? I didn't know at first. The computer voice went into silence for a minute. I don't know how much time passed in his virtual universe, but I know it probably seemed longer to him than to me. I was minding my own business. I just dropped off a dinner order for the school board, and on my way to the next delivery, a bunch of jeeps pulled out in front of me and blocked the road. Someone came to my driver's side window and, well, I don't remember anything until I woke up in a room being interrogated by a man in sunglasses. They didn't ask me any questions that made any sense. I just responded as best I could, hoping that maybe it was a misunderstanding and I could be going free soon. But no, here I was being grilled constantly, then having my picture taken. I don't recall too much else except for all the trips to the room with the portal. And Klain. Portal? Klain? There's a room on this floor. They have something that looks like a stargate, but a lot smaller. It goes elsewhere. I don't know what that place is, but whatever it is, it's wrong. Very, very wrong. Things live there, things I hope I never have to see. What about Klein? He knows what's over there. They sent him so many times. But whatever is over there, they keep adding things to him. He's never the same as he was when he comes back. I haven't seen him lately, so I can't imagine there's much of Klein left to try and rescue. But why you? Why him? I heard them once. They consider us nobodies. Who would care if we went missing? This, of everything I had heard over the past few days, was the most disheartening, horrible thing of all, and it made my fists clench. Who are they, Peter? I don't know, but they aren't human. I'm not saying that to exaggerate. They are literally something else. They think they're so smart hiding themselves away, but I've seen them. I know what they really are, and they're terrifying. Peter, have you seen the video? The video of me shooting him? Yes. They had a good laugh about it. They told me how hard it was to get a voice module on my facial features just right when I wasn't on the internet much. But they loved to gloat about it. They made that video days after they kidnapped me, me murdering somebody to frame me, after they kidnapped the both of us, it just made me feel so helpless. I knew then that nobody would be coming to help me. But I'm here now, Peter. Come on, I'll take the hard drive and get you home. The computer went silent again for a little while. You really think I can go home like this? My family needs to remember me how I was. I'm just a little more than a video game now. I'm just ones and zeros that are pretending to be human. Maybe now that I know exactly what happened to me, maybe I can do something about this place. Please go, Mr. Thurwell. Thank you for finding me. Tell everyone. I nodded, said a goodbye, and left the room. I realized I had no idea how to get back out of here. I suddenly wished for a ball of yarn to help me find my way, but unfortunately, I left mine in my other pants. Knowing how I approached this room, I tried to retrace my steps as best I could, but as I did, I noticed something else. The humidity was drying up, and the hallway felt decidedly cooler. Peter must have been doing something to the climate controls, and if I guessed correctly, 
It was going to be them, not me, that was going to be feeling uncomfortable soon. I made a few more turns and wondered if I was actually going the right way when I came to a stretch that let me know I definitely was not. The room had a large glass pane that allowed a complete view of the interior. And, as Peter had said, there was a large, round gate against the wall. It was not much taller than a person, but if it ever detached from the wall, I would assume it more than capable of crushing whoever it fell on. It was also the only place where I could see those who worked here. They appeared human enough, and to be honest, I was not at all surprised to see Chief Morgan in the room. Knowing he was definitely involved added more relief to my situation than anything else, because it confirmed yet another thing I was correct about. They spoke, but the glass muffled a lot of the sound, and I was only able to catch a few small segments of conversation between Morgan and one of the other technicians running a set of monitors nearby. And he's been over how long? Over hours, sir. Good. They must be finishing the last of the grafts. Just be careful, they said. It might make him hostile for a day or two. I said, they always, sir. Not like this, he wasn't. The portal began to shimmer, and a shadow began to appear from its depths, like a swimmer from the bottom of a pool. The shape was indistinct, but I began to realize it was not due to distortion from the dimensional travel but because what was coming through was so wrong. Sir, just, uh, have you noticed it's getting cold in here? Is it? Does it really matter? Just have the Wranglers ready for Clay anyway. And then the lights went out. A loud alarm began to blare, and spinning flashing lights blinked, with red emergency lighting pointing towards an exit. I heard scrambling from inside the room, shouting and then screaming, as I assumed, the Wranglers failed in their job to rein in what remained of school board member Robert Klein. I heard visceral tearing sounds, and then bloodied shapes flung against the glass, shattering it. One body flew out in the hallway, and for the briefest moment in the light, I saw an inhuman form with a large green bulbous head like an iguana, but with larger eyes and more freakish lumpy skin. Then something began to slither out of the broken window in my direction. It moaned, wailing as if in awful pain, hoping to spread to someone else. I ran. I heard the slithery shape slamming into the walls behind me, somehow keeping a steady pace, frightfully fast for whatever it was as I followed the emergency lights. I heard more noises, watching as doors opened in the hallway, and I saw red eyes glaring at me, giving off horrible hissing noises as I blundered onward. Their hisses interrupted as the misshapen creature behind me took out its anger on whatever it could find. After what seemed like forever, my running, tearing my already injured throat more raw, I saw the sliding door up ahead still open, the unconscious or dead guard still lying in the maintenance room. I tried to pull the door closed behind me, and I was successful. Just as it closed, I saw something in the dark, only slightly illuminated by the flickering red emergency lights. I'm glad I could see it no more. I fled back to my car, I got on my phone, and put in a call to some friends of mine, giving them the coordinates for the lab so they could send in some agents they could trust. Then I left back for the airport. I will admit... I was a little bit of a sight as I boarded, but nobody asked me any questions, and I was thankful for that. Though security did eye me a little longer than usual. So, there you have it. Wish I had more good news, but in the end, there was nothing I could do to help Peter or Klein. The only thing I could do I'd already mentioned, having connected my friends for assistance. But that led nowhere. By the time they arrived, the compound had been cleaned out. No trace of the inhabitants, just an empty space. Whoever was there, they were cleaned out and gone in a real hurry. I don't know if what is left of Peter or Klein is still alive, captured and living in a tortured existence, or if they've been disposed of as no longer useful. What I do know, though, is the 
despite getting much closer to this story than I had ever intended. I realize in telling there's some wisdom I gathered from this whole ordeal. I still don't know who did this, though knowing urban legends around the internet, I can take a few guesses. What I can say is that they're so full of their plans that they believe themselves untouchable. Their whole plan relied entirely on ignorance and apathy to work. It's easy to hide the disappearance of people when no one asks questions, looking at the evidence with a cursory glance and never digging deeper. Sure, they used deepfake technology to hide faces, but it was detected. Even as the technology improves, it can only fool those who want to be fooled. That any technology designed to deceive can be overcome if we all remain skeptical. But beyond that, I would never have known about any of this. I never would have been able to bring this to you if Peter had not thrown a wrench into their plans by, of all things, sending a short message to those he loved. They considered him claimed to be nobodies, people that wouldn't be missed. But in their haughtiness, their hubris, they never realized one of the most important things of all. None of us is a nobody, because even the smallest act can bring good to this world. After what I've seen, we need as much of it as we can get. I hope you enjoyed AI Cry for Help by James Thurwood, last performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him. Well, bless my stars. Seems like he wants to keep that information under wrap. Well, considering what he just went through, maybe he may need a few months to get over it. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's feature author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you've enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, Please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month. You get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012. All of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyrie channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Chirey. Until next week, stay spooky. Get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>
If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>